So we're going to do something a little different for our reading of Scripture today. I'm going to read the Isaiah text, but then afterwards, you want to have part of your hymnal open. We're going to do a responsive reading and prayer. It's Canticle of Covenant Faithfulness. It's number 125 in the red hymnal. So I'll read the scripture, and then we're going to sing that first. Alan's going to play that line of music. It's the same tune as Rock of Ages, if you know that hymn. That's a little more popular of a hymn. And everywhere there's a red R, we will sing that line together. And then in the bold, you all will respond, and I'll read the non-bolden text. Um, but, But first, let me read Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. Ho, which is, this is a Hebrew word for emphasis. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know. And nations that do not know you shall run to you because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. And so Alan's going to play that line from the canticle for us briefly, and then we'll sing it together, and then we'll do the responsive reading. Seek the Lord who now is present. Call upon the Lord who is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return that the Lord may have mercy on them, that our God may abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Your face, Lord, do I see. Hide not your face from me. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I intend and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Your face, Lord, do I seek. I know. Would you all pray with me? God of self-giving love, who in Christ pours yourself out for us in grace, open our hearts to the word that you are speaking to us today by the word made flesh, who is Jesus. Empower us by the Holy Spirit that the work of grace and love that you seek to do will be fulfilled in us that we may be for you people of grace in the world, people of love in a world that can sometimes feel so full of violence and hate, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may be bearers of a kingdom of transformation. 
Open our hearts today, God, to receive the word to sustain us for that work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, church, so today we're going to do something a little different at the beginning of this sermon. I'm going to give all of you your first cello lesson as taught by someone who only did a few years of cello in middle and high school. But we're going to do this together, okay? So feel free if you need to get a little bit of elbow room to scooch around in your pews. And I want everyone to stick out your left hand like this and pretend like you're holding a, an invisible glass of water. Looks good. Looks good. Now I want you to make sure that the fingers on your left hand are about an inch apart. So not together, but about an inch apart. And your thumb around the back. Okay? And you see, the cello doesn't have frets, so like, like a guitar has frets, it tells you where the notes are on the neck. A cello doesn't have those, so the importance of the spacing is so that the intonation of your notes will be proper. So this makes sure that the notes you play will be in tune when you put your hand on the right place in the neck of the cello. And we're going to hold the cello neck, so we're going to put our left hand about six inches from our left cheek, right to the side, as if you're holding that glass of water like a telephone to your ear, because the cello headstock would go here and the neck would go here. Okay, now we've got our left hand down. I want you to take your right hand, and I want you to hold your hand like you're holding a little bug or something. A bow is about a half inch thick, with three fingers down and the thumb on the back like that. And I want you to practice moving your bow. It should be all wrist motion. There you go. All right, and now I want you to put the bow on the strings. I want you to make sure that your arms are out at 90 degrees. There you go. It's very comfortable, right? Don't you want to do a whole, a whole 10 minute sonata like this? And the, the bow, you don't push down. And I want you to practice playing on those strings. Okay, you can put your hands down. Thank you for indulging me. The, the view from up here was great. I don't know if you all had fun, but I had a lot of fun watching you do that. Now, whenever you learn, believe it or not, cello is one of the easier instruments to get started on in, in a string orchestra. The, those body motions, as, as difficult as they might seem, are more natural than, say, what a violinist or a viola player has to do, or a contrabass player. Oh, pray for contrabass players if you have time this week to pray for them. But what I just showed you all would be home base, to begin playing that instrument, to, to, to know that you had this, this solid foundation in order to, to, to play that instrument well, you would start there. Now, obviously, as more complex music would be brought to you, as more difficult music would be put in front of you, you would have to change your posture a little bit. You'd have to move your hand in different ways up the neck of a cello. And especially as you get higher up, your fingers' spacing would change. But that bass, that home bass that you just learned, would be the foundation that would prepare you for a long time of cello music. It would be the place you would return to whenever, whenever you just needed to, to center yourself on the music you were playing. And so next week, at the beginning of our sermon, we will begin using box cello suites and we'll all play together. I imagine you all will bring your cello. But we need those fundamentals, that home base, to begin as musicians. I'm sure when you're playing piano, you have your home base with your hands on the keys. And, and though you move away from it, you return to it at some point. You can think about a carpenter who teaches you how to hold a hammer the proper way. There's the, there's the home base of how to swing a hammer so that you're as accurate and as good at your profession as you can be. Obviously, when you get put in a pinch, you might hold the hammer in different ways. Every profession, every craft has that home base, that, that basic posture that is supposed to set you up for success further down the road. It's hard to know exactly what Isaiah's first audience heard when, when they heard chapter 55 recited to them. You see, scholars think that while Isaiah starts before the exile, before Babylon comes in and destroys the temple and destroys Jerusalem, that this section of Isaiah was written to an Israelite community that was in exile, that was in Babylon, that had been devastated, that had lost everything. And so the first thing they hear at the beginning of chapter 55 is this promise, Come, all who thirst. Come and drink wine and milk without price. Come, come celebrate this kingdom, this, this gift, this, this flourishing life in God. And then they would have possibly heard the charge that to keep that promise. Forsake wickedness. Give up unrighteous thoughts. Commit to, commit to the way of God that is higher than your way. And they would have paired that. To have this flourishing, wonderful life, we have to commit ourselves to the way of God. And it's just so simple, right? 
A plus B equals C. If you do everything right, everything will turn out okay. Yet life is rarely, if ever, so simple. And the Israelites, hearing this for the first time, find themselves in a very unsimple, very complicated place. They are in Babylon. They are being forced to worship Babylonian idols. They are forced, being forced to partake in Babylonian sacrifices and culture, all while the land that their God had promised them, the land where God said he would be with them, lay in ruins. And on top of that, earlier in Isaiah, we hear about these religious and political leaders of the Israelites who exploit the most vulnerable people in Israel, the Jerusalem leaders who put unjust burdens on the rest of the, of the nation and of the poor, that the people entrusted to keep Israel safe, to keep, people, keep Israel following God, to keep Israel on the right path, were not following these lofty ways and have betrayed that trust. I wonder if we can sympathize. In Isaiah 55, God says, Seek the Lord where God will be found. Call on God while God is near. And it sounds so simple. Seek the Lord while he can be found. And we may not see the irony of this call if we don't think about that history. Because for Israel, the presence of God, the presence of Yahweh, was centered on the temple in Jerusalem. And this is written at a time when that temple has been destroyed leveled, flattened in 586 BCE. And mere years after the temple had been destroyed comes this confusing question to Israel. Where? This consuming worry. Where is God now? Where is this presence of God? Where has it gone now that the temple is gone? So Isaiah 55 verse 6 is telling a diaspora of people to seek God where God can be found. And their response would have justifiably been, where can God be found? What do you mean? Now maybe we find it hard to feel that way. Or maybe we too know how it feels to ask that question. Where is God now? Where is God in the midst of what we experience day to day and week to week or what others experience that is far worse than we can imagine? Where is God now? And I believe in our hearts is a desire to draw near to this God. The central calling for us in Lent is to draw nearer to this God, even while we might feel rudderless, drifting in a world where God can seem hidden. And I don't think that's our fault Thousands of years later, we might be able to sympathize with the Israelites when they hear that verse. Perhaps you felt the same futility and confusion recently in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of international conflict or civil discord or pervasive injustice. But the calling of Lent is mixed with that promise of Easter. And it can sound very similar to Isaiah 55. Draw near to God and release those things that separate us and join in the abundant life of Christ. But life gets complicated. To be those trees that bear fruit, as Jesus calls, is not always simple. Sometimes we're not getting the nutrients, the, 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 the right soil like that tree was in Luke. Sometimes we feel cut off from that, which can grow love and grace in us. Sometimes the lofty ways are just too lofty. And I wonder if in the complexity of life, the church might be a home base, a solid foundation for people who are seeking God together. Now, even that's difficult, right? We know of examples of churches that have gone astray, of leaders who act harmfully towards others, of leaders that are not a home base, a safe place for others. But there's something about our communal faith that draws us back to a place where the grace of Christ can be found. And it's not always in the building, but in the ways that we relate with one another and with the world. The spiritual grandfather of Methodism, you guys hear me mention him often, was a man named John Wesley. And he was well known, he, the reason we're called Methodist is because he believed in a methodical approach to grace, that there were certain things you could do to experience grace, and we'll get into that in a moment. But he, he believed in these things called means of grace, that in our life there are certain things that we can draw to where grace is present, even when we may not know it's there, that grace will be present for us. 
And he believed that while grace was not limited to these few small things, that there were certain practices, certain home bases, certain places to go back to where we know that God would be present with us and to sustain our faith even through difficult times. And John Wesley was someone who had gone through a very difficult time of faith in many ways. And so he he called out these means of grace in two forms. He called them works of piety and works of mercy. I think it's lovely that there's works of piety that focus on the self and works of mercy that focus on giving of the self to others. And just like John Wesley, who said that there is no holiness without social holiness, there is no faith without social faith, he divides them into individual and communal practices. And so I'm going to read a few for you here. In the individual acts of piety, he says, read its reading, meditating, studying scripture, prayer, fasting, regularly attending worship, being in community, healthy living, and sharing our faith with others were ways that we can maybe experience faith. But in communal practices, he talks about sharing the sacraments together. We're going to do one of those today. Christian conferencing, which really just meant being in community with other people, seeking to live a more faithful life. And Bible study. But that's only half of the equation for him. The second half is works of mercy. Because when we're lost, sometimes the best thing to do is to try to produce the fruit that it can be difficult to produce. In individual practices, he talks about doing good works, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, giving generously to the needs of others. And then he brings up communal practices, seeking justice, ending oppression and discrimination, and addressing the needs of the poor. In each of these things, Wesley believed that even if it was difficult for us to see it, we were at that moment drawing near to God. Baptism, what we're going to celebrate today, is one of those means of grace. It is a reminder, not just to the children we will baptize, but to each of us here, of a grace that exists whether we can see it or not for us, that in this act, God calls us children of God. That God seeks to renew in us life and life in abundance. That no matter what the world may claim us to be, the first claim on us is that we are beloved, that we are made with purpose, and that we are called into community that feels the same way about us, that treats us in that way. In the midst of a world that feels so caught up and thrown about, the question is, how can the church be home base? How can we be a place for people to come into and experience grace so that they might go and experience grace in giving that love to others? What would that mean for you? Where are the home bases, the the channels, the means of grace that you have experienced God present with you? How can you share those? What would this mean for a church? Would we have to change the way that we posture ourselves before other people? Would we have to change the message we say? Would we have to act differently towards those in our midst? Are we inviting them to be a place where they can experience the presence of a loving God? And what does this mean for the practice of Lent? As we draw near to this promise of Easter, as we we discipline ourselves to be closer to Christ, what are the ways that we are seeking grace this Lent season? Seeking to be closer to the heart of the one who has given himself for us. The world is a chaotic place at times. It can be hard to know just where God might be found. But I can tell you one thing, that in the way that we care for and love one another, the Spirit is with us. In the way that we care for and give of ourselves for someone else, the Spirit is with us. And in the way that we continue to retell the story time and again, just as Israel did in Babylon, that we are a people loved by a great God who is calling us to abundant and flourishing life. The way that we can continue to share that story with someone and put that in their hearts and treat them in that way. We get to be for them the presence of God. We get to experience in them the presence of God. So even amidst our doubts and difficulties, let us seek God where God might be found. Let us seek God in the midst of this place, in the midst of the people, more importantly, who God has called us to be in community with. Would you pray with me?
And so, God, even in the midst of doubt, we know that where two or three are gathered in your name, there your spirit is amongst them. But we also remember the primordial story that Israel learned. That our earth is full of your glory. That creation speaks of your wonders, of your higher ways. Your ways of grace, of love, of self-giving, of forgiveness. Help us not to be caught up in the patterns that make us selfish. That distance us from others. But by your ever-present spirit, draw us closer to one another and to all of our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen.